Well, hello, good morning, and thank you for all being here. Um, NIST, the place I work, uh, has a long-standing interest in maintaining a database of fundamental constants. And one of them is the all properties of muons. And Randolph Paul, our guest today, has been at the forefront of experimental science on the muon. And in particular, control, measuring the proton radius with that. Um, he did his PhD at, in Zurich, um, where I think in the late 90s and the early 2000s, where he started up helping set up these experiments with the muons and making the first muonic hydrogen atoms. Uh, since then, he has been working in that field. And in 2016, he joined his current university, which is in Mainz, the Johannes Gutenberg University. And he will tell us some more about the muon and all things that are interesting to it. Okay, Randolph, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Aite. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, thanks to everybody to... Uh, be here and listen to, to what I have to tell you. Um, one correction, I was not the first to make muonic hydrogen uh, atoms. It, uh, we were the first to I'm do laser spectroscopy on there. Yeah, no mm. problem. <laughs> I just don't want to take somebody else's uh, credit. Okay, so I'm going to talk today, I'm going to talk about uh, nucleon structure, basically proton structure, and um, the structure of simple nuclei uh, from doing laser spectroscopy, mostly on muonic atoms and ions, and um, also some of the measurements that I've been involved in in my previous place in the Ted Hensch group in Garching, Germany, where we did spectroscopy on normal hydrogen and deuterium. Um, and that gets all linked together in, in trying to unravel the, the sizes and other properties of these light nuclei and also learning something about atomic physics, the Ripper constant and testing quantum electrodynamics and the standard model. Oops. So my um, basically picture of the universe is this. This is the chart of the uh, simplest radii, uh, simplest nuclei, starting with the hydrogen proton, uh, the deuteron, uh, helium, lithium, and beryllium um, nuclei. And these nuclear radii are important um, to understand the structure of the nucleon, the, the proton, but also the structure of um, more complicated but still simple nuclei from up initial calculations or phenomenological uh, two or three nucleon forces. They are also important um, in precision tests of quantum electrodynamics and the standard model. And they are, of course, um, um, important for fundamental constants, um, in particular, as, um, as I just said, the Ripper constant, and the, which is uh, uh, very much correlated with the proton and deuteron charge radii. So these, these uh, nuclear radii can, can be determined in atomic spectroscopy. Um, but then, of course, um, can, uh, the, 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 the usual way to determine these nuclear radii is in scattering experiment. And this is all done in order to determine form factors and structure functions, polarizabilities, all these, these uh, observables that we have in nuclear physics, but which we can see in atomic physics experiment as well. And of course, as I said a couple of times, fundamental constants and, uh, and tests of QED. Something like 10 years ago or so, um, our, our experiment, which we had started uh, 20 plus years ago at PSI, um, for the first time produced a value for the proton arm as charge radius. And uh, to our, everybody's big astonishment, including us, um, our value was 4% um, um, smaller than the, um, at that time, accepted value from CODATA, which um, included all the world data on hydrogen spectroscopy and elastic electron proton scattering. So this is 0.88 femtometer with an error of less than a percent. And our uncertainty was a factor of 10 or so better but uh, 0.84 femtometers, that is 4% smaller. And this proton radius puzzle made, of course, um, uh, quite some excitement because, uh, as you all know, the, the muon has the second problem. It's anomalous magnetic moment, which has been off from the standard model prediction by something like four sigma as well. And of course, there was this dream that this may um, together be a sign of new physics, which should occur, uh, should pop up with muons um, about 40,000 times, so m squared, more probable, or more, more uh, significantly than with electrons. Um, th 
this made quite some headlines. I, I, I like both uh, best this this uh, cartoon from the New York Times, where the proton woke up one morning and had four percent less around its waist. I, I could I could have this <laughs> it would be an advantage, but of course you see the quality of this scientific journal here by having the hydrogen atom with two electrons. All right. Um, so from the start, this this is a, a, an old slide, older slide. Um, from the start, this um, this proton radius puzzle seemed to be not such a you know um, um, clear cut uh, puzzle, um, and this discrepancy was not as clear as one uh, as as it looked initially. Because for example, this paper by a group in Bonn in Germany, they had taken uh, electron scattering data, basically the data that uh, led to this point, and added more theory and and additional um, accelerator based measurements, and they came up with depending on their model two small values for the proton charge radius. Which is in agreement with um, with uh, the one that we then measured uh, two years later, and uh, taking this uh, data again with an improved uh, um, setup or with an improved um, uh, method, they they got um, this small radius. And then, depending on whom you ask, you could get you know basically all over the chart. You could go get um, charge radia of the proton from wherever you wanted to. So I will refrain from from talking more about electron scattering because this is not my field of expertise, and I will instead go into atomic physics. Um, you all know that the energy levels of hydrogen have first been uh, described by Bohr or by Rydberg and Bohr, and in the f uh, famous Bohr formula. And uh, in for atomic uh, for for theorists, this is the energy levels are proportional to one over n squared. But since we don't measure in atomic units, but rather in SI units, we need this conversion factor, which is the Ripper constant, which relates um, atomic units to the SI units where we do the measurements. In. Um, but of course, you know that also that the um, hydrogen atom is more complicated than this. Um, ah, yeah, and this this uh, proportionality constant is the Ripper constant, yes. And uh, if you look at, take a closer view on the hydrogen energy levels, you see that these many levels and the hyperfine splitting is not even yet in, not even the fine splitting. So this is much more complicated in reality. Um, so these energy levels split and, and are shifted. And let's assume these delta, these shifts, which depend on the quantum numbers, can be calculated to good precision from QED. Then you're left with these two, um, these two uh, coefficients here. One is the, the, the gross structure scaling, which is uh, proportional to the Ripper constant. And then there's another one, which is the finite size effect which is 1.2 megahertz for the ground state of hydrogen. It scales up with one over n cubed. Uh, it's proportional to the square of the charge distribution radius, square RMS, RMS radius uh, squared of the charge distribution. And it's significant only for S states. That's what this delta L0 is for. This can be understood in terms of the wave function. Um, that is the probability to find the electron somewhere. And for S states, this is, um, this uh, radial wave function has a maximum at r equals zero, and that is actually in the center of the proton. Okay, and for p states, there is no probability to find um, the electron inside the proton, so the proton doesn't affect the um, the p states. For the s states, you can imagine while the electron is inside the proton, it sees a Coulomb attraction from all sides, which means no Coulomb attraction in total, and that means on average these s states are less bound. The larger the proton is, the more time the muon spends inside the the proton, the the, the less bound these states are. Okay, our research is uh, related to muonic atoms and ions, and this is a hydrogen-like system, um, which is orbited by a negative muon instead of the electrons. Um, it's hydrogen-like, which means that we understand, uh, or the theorists uh, understand and can calculate the, the theory to basically arbitrary precision, and we are always dealing with one muon at a time. Um, the advantage or why we use muonic hydrogen is that the muon has a mass which is 200 times larger than the electron mass. And that means that the Bohr radius is 200 times smaller. And it's 200 times smaller in X, Y, and Z. And that means that the wave function overlap is 200 to the third power or a few million times larger between the muon and the proton than it is for the electron and the proton. And that makes the muonic uh, atoms and ions this, this incredibly sensitive probe of nuclear properties. Um, muonic hydrogen has a level scheme which is very much like normal hydrogen, and the lamp shift is the, the, the quantity we are after because the, the gross structure also scales with the muon mass, and that means that this is two kilo electron from the 1s to the 2s state, and there are no lasers for two kilo electron volt, but the, 
the lamp shift is accessible with lasers at six micrometer. And here you see a, a close up of the real level structure. Um, this is the 2S state, which is split by the hyperfine splitting and the 2P states. And you see the macroscopic finite size effect, which really shifts this 2S level by a lot in our case. Um, it's a 2% effect on the, on the lamp shift. Uh, and that is the reason why we do this experiment in the first place, because it's so very much sensitive. And we only have to measure to 10 to minus 5 uh, in order to be able to determine the charge radius with 10 to minus 3 or so. OK. Um, this innocently looking uh, equation has lots of uh, ingredients uh, by, by many theorists. And I will come to that uh, in a minute. Um, muons are the primary uh, source of, of cosmic rays, right? If you put your hand in the air, then you get about one muon per second per hand. Um, but that's, of course, not good enough uh, for, for doing an experiment. So we go to PSI. They have beautiful accelerators in Switzerland. Everybody knows CERN, which is down here in Geneva, but that's not where we are. We are at PSI, which is about halfway between Zurich and Basel, close to the German border. And um, this has um, uh, the world's strongest proton beam when you measure it coming from a bottle uh, being accelerated and running into a beam dump. We have two and a half milliamps of proton current in a vacuum tube. OK, that's not electrons in a wire. It's protons in a vacuum tube. Um, these protons produce uh, pions, charged, negatively charged pions, um, about 10 to the 9 per second. And we, enter, we let these pions enter into our uh, magnet system. That's our beam line. We've built the world's uh, strongest, most intense um, beam line for negative muons. We have about um, a thousand or more um, negative muons per second with energies of a kilo electron volt. Um, they are created with mega electron volt, tens of mega electron volt, and we decelerate them to a kilo electron volt. And we cool them and detect them uh, at that low uh, energy. Um, and that's key to this experiment. Um, we have a laser hut, uh, lots of shiny lasers. It's a rather complicated laser system. Uh, I will skip over this. If you have ask, uh, questions, you can just ask me and I will try and answer them. And then we merge the muons. This is uh, our target open. Uh, it's about 20 centimeters or eight inches along this uh, side and 10 inches uh, in axial direction. The muons enter. They are detected in very thin carbon foils, only, only uh, 20 nanometers or so thick. They eject electrons, and these electrons are detected. Then they enter uh, through a very thin window, and the muon stops anywhere here in this large target. A laser pulse arrives, enters uh, through a tiny hole in this mirror. There's a very elongated multipass uh, mirror cavity. This fills the whole volume. And no matter where this one muonic hydrogen atom sits, it gets excited. Um, and then 2S2P excitation follows, is followed by a 2P1S Lyman alpha X-ray which is detected in these avalanche photodiodes, large area avalanche photodiodes. And then we have energy resolution, time resolution, and we count clicks, basically. We count photons. And we count photons while changing the laser uh, wavelength or frequency. And then we get a resonance. And uh, this is our, our first, um, first measurement, um, which took a while to, to materialize because we were always looking in the wrong position. It, we, we had believed that the proton is 0.88 femtometers, which is around here. And finally, when we tuned our laser to 0.84 femtometers, we saw this, this peak. And uh, this is the, the discrepancy, this five sigma discrepancy between the code eight oh six value, which was um, valid when we published this in 2010, and our value. OK, so this is a, a spectrum that we see. It's, it's a time in microseconds. Ah, I forgot to tell you that the muon lives only for two microseconds. But that's plenty of time for us to do the experiment. Um, when, when the muons enter the target, 99% of them decay to the ground state, and we see the photons coming from that one. Then we have some background, and when we tune the laser to resonance, we see the second peak here, which is the 2S to 2P transition, um, which signals that we've uh, matched the laser frequency with the lamp shift energy. OK. OK, so I told uh, you that there is this equation which relates our measured lamp shift to various um, um, uh, properties like the, the charge radius, but also others. Um, the good news about this is that the um, these are all uh, very well calculable. At least the QED part is very well under control. Uh, 99 or so percent of this QED term is given by this uh, one electron uh, positron loop vacuum polarization um, term. But we also include higher orders and then muon, muonic lamp shift and 20 others. And this gives an estimate of the uncertainty here. 
Um, then this is uh, the uh, very important term. It's the so-called polarizability um, two photon exchange. That's when the muon exchanges two virtual photons with the nucleus, with the proton. And this can be elastic. So the proton stays a proton between these two vertices. And that gives uh, rise to a parameter, uh, to, to a number which is proportional, can be parameterized as being proportional to the third power of this charge radius. And this is the, has been the battlefield for a long time. This is the polarizability contribution of the proton. That's a virtual excitation of the proton to the delta resonance or higher lying states of the excited proton. And that was, uh, people suspected that this could be miscalculated and that would then uh, result in us determining a wrong charge radius because if you don't get this term right, you measure this, it's hard to, I mean, you, you want to extract that one. In the meantime, I think this has settled and people believe that this initial calculation was good. Uh, maybe the discussion is about the, the question of the error bar, if this is uh, maybe a, a little bit under uh, optimistic on our side or so. Um, in, um, in terms of you know, importance, this is a log scale, right? So this one loop electron vacuum polarization here is, is the dominant term. Then the second most important effect is the proton size effect. And then there are other QED effects. This uh, two photon exchange is tiny compared to the discrepancy, which is if you, if you translate this difference in charge radii into something like a missing QED contribution, for example, this would have to be the fifth largest contribution. Uh, and uh, this was from the start not very probable that, that this could be the, the, um, the reason. Yeah, so this, this uh, inelastic two photon exchange term, the polarizability, uh, basically boils down to the question, do we know some subtraction function which is needed in order to make a dispersion relation on the nucleon um, converge? And this, this subtraction function is only known at Q square equals zero and at high Q square. And the question is what you put in here, how does this continuation then gave rise to the question, what is the uncertainty of this? Um, um, that's a very interesting nuclear physics topic or nucleon physics topic. Yeah, you can try to calculate this um, and you can also extract this from um, Compton scattering data. And uh, as well as you can extract the radius from electron scattering, you can also determine these other uh, properties of the nucleon and later of the nucleus from electron scattering. And that is a nice link between observables in electron scattering and atomic physics. Okay, so the bottom line is, uh, I think this, um, maybe this error bar is a little bit optimistic, other people say, but it's certainly not large enough, uh, uh, this error bar to e explain the discrepancy. Good. Um, we've also done measurements on Munich deuterium, and uh, that also boils down to the polarizability or to the, to the, you know, maybe dynamic, you can call it the dynamic properties of the nucleus, how it, the excitation takes place. Um, uh, this is a very busy slide, but I'll walk you through this. So this is now the deuteron charge radius. And the codata value is basically related to the proton radius in codata. I will show you this in a second. There is some deuterium spectroscopy as well. Um, and there's elastic electron deuteron scattering, but this has an uncertainty which is too large to be able to separate um, these two solutions. Our muonic deuterium value, when we published it, was here. Again, smaller, but now it's not 4%, but it's a, it's much, a much smaller discrepancy. In terms of sigmas, it's the same five sigmas. And then over time, theory evolved and it moved a little bit. Um, the, our, our Munich deuterium deuteron radius moved uh, a little bit upwards to that point. Okay, I said that this codata deuteron radius uh, basically boils down to measurement of the proton radius. And that is because we have measured in Garching the difference of the 1s, 2s transition in normal hydrogen and normal deuterium in the Hench group. And from this isotope shift together with theory, one gets a very good number for the difference of squared deuteron radius minus squared proton radius, okay? So this difference is much better determined than the individual radii from, from uh, normal electrons. And that has to do with the fact that there are cancellations which occur and you can estimate these uncalculated higher order terms, how they evolve with, with mass and get rid of them. Um, so um, this difference, if you plug it into the proton radius from codata, you get the codata deuteron radius. And if you plug it into the proton radius from muonic hydrogen, you get this pink point here. And this is a very small uncertainty. Um, and now it's in good agreement with the value that you get from Munich deuterium alone without the isotope shift. So we call this the expected 
deuteron charge radius. And this is the observed deuteron charge radius from Munich deuterium. And they are in good agreement. And they are both show this five sigma difference to the, to the old codata 2014 value. Okay. Now you see two um, error bars here for the deuteron radius. Uh, one is the inner one is the experimental uncertainty. That's 2.127 plus my, uh, and then two digits. And in, in the last two digits, you have 13 as an uncertainty. And um, the outer uncertainty is from, from the polarizability. It's the same two photon term um, as I showed you before in the proton, but now it's even more complicated because you have a nucleus, which is two nucleons. So you can excite the nucleus and the deuteron is only weakly bound. It's only two mega electron volt. And so you can, whereas the proton is bound, uh, so the first excited state in the proton is 300 mega electron volts away from the ground state. So you can easily perturb the deuteron, but you can also perturb each of the individual nucleons inside the deuteron. Okay. And that's why this- uh, Ron, uh, Randolph, it's uh, Charles speaking. So yes. this, this polarization correction, Yes. It, 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 there's a contribution to this just from, let's say the classical, well, classical electrical polarizability of either the proton or the deuteron, isn't it? Yes. So yes. It's, yeah, you, it, it's, it looks like two photon exchange, but it, it's something that would be calculated just in ordinary second order perturbation theory, but with of course the appropriate, you know, many particle um, terms associated with the structure of the object. Yes, so it, it's, it, it contains both, right? So it contains the, the nuclear polarizability, but also the individual nucleon polarizabilities, because you can right. have both, right? The, the virtual photon can talk to either the complete nucleus or to each of these nucleons. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, and you see that this, this is the dominant theory, uh, the dominant uncertainty in our deuteron radius. And um, this is summarized on this, on this slide here. Um, actually, um, it's not only two photon exchange, you also have to consider three photon exchange with the nucleus. That's one of the more recent developments um, by Kalinowski and also Pachutsky in uh, two years ago. Um, they found that for the, for the um, deuteron, this three photon exchange is uh, very large. And this made a dominant, the dominant shift here from this point to that point. This is uh, due to three photon corrections. So this was astonishingly large. Okay, so now we have these, um, um, the, uh, the equation, which is the measured lamp shift in Munich deuterium is the QD part, which is safe. Then there's the finite size effect. And then there is this two and three photon exchange contribution, okay? So the, the theoretical uncertainty for this is, um, is, is this quantity and our experimental uncertainty is six times better. Okay, so you can do two things. You can either use this calculated uh, polarizability and um, plug it into the formula. You have measured the left-hand side. You can determine the charge radius. This is what you get here. And this is the uncertainty. And this is the light shaded band in the previous plot. But you can also to turn this around. If you say, I know how large the deuteron is, if I know it from the proton plus the isotope shift, then I can plug in the value here. I have measured this and I can determine the polarizability. And that is a factor of three more accurate than the best calculation from, from uh, um, nuclear models. Okay, so this is an interplay where if we have only theory, we can determine charge radii limited by the polarizability. But if we get a charge radius from somewhere else, which is usually an electronic atom because there these polarizability contributions are much smaller we can use the muonic measurements to determine polarizabilities. And that in turn gives us a deep insight into, these, uh, into the stuff which is happening inside the, inside the nuclei, inside these light, light nuclei. Okay, so this was the situation uh, some years ago. Um, and of course, uh, with the advent of the proton radius discrepancy, many groups have started um, their own projects uh, to, to find out if the, the discrepancy is, is true um, or if, this is just a fluke and um, that involved new measurements in hydrogen, but also new measurements in electron scattering. And I will uh, briefly talk about, about these. I showed you this before um, and the, this energy formula, uh, the energy levels depend on the ripper constant and the proton radius that are, that's two unknowns. And if you wanted to determine these two unknowns, you have to measure two transitions. One of those is usually the one is two is transition because that's so 
much more accurate than anybody else. Any, any other measurement that you can take it for granted. It's a few parts in 10 to the 15. And uh, the other transitions are measured on the 10 to minus 12 level. So um, usually you take the one as two as transition and combine it with any other transition up here to get this correlated pair of charge radii and, and ripple constants. And if you do that, you get um, this, uh, this list of, of various measurements pre-2014. Um, for example, if you combine 1s2s with 2s2p, um, the classical lamp shift measurements, you get this charge radius. Actually, you don't actually need the ripple constant for that because it's only measurement in 10 to the 8 or so. But if you take these optical transitions, you always get a charge radius and you can put a parallel scale here, which is the ripple constant because they are 100%, nearly 100% correlated. Um, you see that they are uh, clustering on the right hand side of our muonic hydrogen value, but they are not individually, they were never really discrepant with our uh, measurement. Only if you average these all together, you get this um, uh, small uncertainty that then is a discrepancy to our, to our muonic measurement. And so the first, um, um, the first measurement which was published in, uh, after this discrepancy was found was from our uh, from our uh, our experiment in Garching, where we determined the 2s 4p energy difference, and this was basically chosen because we had the laser on the table. 2s 4p is one laser uh, uh, doubling before 1s 2s. Okay, it's 486 nanometer, and we had this laser standing around, and so we used it. And the um, the trick of this experiment is the following: we use the the setup that is usually used to measure 1s 2s. That is a hydrogen discharge producing atomic hydrogen, which is cooled in a cryogenic nozzle to six Kelvin. Then we have a beam coming out from this nozzle. And then we overlap this beam with a 243 nanometer laser in a cavity that we get these counter propagating, oops, counter -propagating photons, which make a two photon transition to the 2S state. And then we, um, we quench the 2S state here and count the photons as a function of laser frequency to determine a one is two S transition. Now we had this 486 nanometer, uh, 486 nanometer laser in there already because we wanted to measure the velocity distribution of the excited atoms by doing a one photon transition at some angle to be able to determine the Doppler shift. And so we thought the only thing you have to do is to turn this to 90 degrees <laughs> and then you can measure without Doppler uh, shift and then you should be able to measure a second transition in hydrogen and um, get a new ripple constant. I was of course very naive. <laughs> in the end, it took uh, it took us four years or so to get to the final result. Um, yeah, of course, this Doppler effect is huge, and if you make any mistake in the alignment of a laser with respect to an atomic beam, um, then uh, you get you get any number that you like, but not the correct proton radius. Um, we got around. Oops, we got around this by. But as other people before us, by taking a laser and retro re reflecting it onto itself. Actually, the laser came out of a fiber, and then we locked um, the, the retro reflecting mirror um, such that the light going back into the fiber was maximized. And so we had nearly perfectly counter propagating laser beams. And that then gives, um, if you misalign the angle between these two laser beams with respect to the atomic beam, you get a red shifted and a blue shifted um, line. But the center of gravity is nearly unchanged with respect to the to the true value. This has been done before, um, such a, such measurements. But our advantage is, um, I would say, twofold. Uh, one is that we have a cryogenic hydrogen beam. We produce atoms and cool them down in a nozzle, so we are at six Kelvin, in contrast to other measurements which were done at room temperature or even higher temperatures. But maybe more importantly is our um, optical excitation of the 2s um, of the 2s atoms uh, allows us to select one hyperfine state, the f equals zero state, and then if you go from the f equals zero state up to the 4p state, um, this is uh, much cleaner and much easier to analyze than if you had an unknown mixture of Zeeman sublevels that could then talk to all Zeeman sublevels uh, afterwards. Okay. All right, and then when we did this, uh, we came about an effect that was uh, brought to our attention by Eric Hessels from Toronto, um, which is in principle crystal clear, but we had all forgotten about it, it seems. Um, that is, if you tune your laser to the 2S 4P one half transition, for example, and you look at the fluorescence light, 
Uh, there's also a possibility that the uh, photon uh, is emitted by going very far detuned via the 4p3 half transition. Uh, the laser does the same thing, but these two photons now interfere. And if you look at this interference effect, you get, um, if you look at the power radiated by these two dipoles, which are oscillating, driven by the, the laser field, you get two Lorentzians plus a cross term. And this quantum interference shift, quantum interference shift, was observed, uh, you know that, um, um, in, in lithium. And um, we saw it uh, very clearly, and it was a major source of headache in our experiment in, in the 2S4P excitation. Uh, and then we decided, and, and the fun thing is that this, this uh, quantum interference depends on the geometry of your setup. Um, it depends on the angle between the laser polarization and the emission direction of the photon, which is then here uh, emitted from the 4P state to the ground state. And so what we did is we built um, a split detector and could rotate the laser beam. Here you see now this, this uh, 486 nanometer laser beam coming from a fiber into this retro reflector and back into the fiber. And we could rotate the laser polarization. And we had two detectors where we could at the same time measure uh, photons which are uh, emitted along the polarization axis and perpendicular to it. And by looking at these two uh, detectors at the same time, we observed the following. By turning um, the laser polarization, you could shift the apparent position of the signal if you fit it with the wrong function, namely just two Lorentzians. You could shift it by plus minus 50 or so kilohertz. And the proton radius puzzle, the discrepancy, the di difference between these two proton radii is only nine kilohertz or se seven kilohertz on this transition. So this is like 10 times the proton radius discrepancy. And you could basically tune in the desired proton radius if you did not uh, uh, consider it correctly by changing the laser polarization. Um, this interference pattern looks different for the 4P3 half. That's just because the emission spectrum for this 4P3 half, the emission, um, um, geometry is different. Um, and these, um, these dashed lines are um, uh, uh, calculations which are basically up in issue. There's no, no fitting of this. It's um, you, you plug in the, the, uh, the geometry and everything into the, into the Monte Carlo that ex describes our experiment. And this is what you get. And this uh, works very well in explaining the, the measured um, shift. And if you do the correct fit, um, then all this oscillation goes away, in particular here for the 4P3 half, which was the second measurement when, where, where we had learned more. Um, these two points are still a bit outlierish. We decided to leave them in because there's nothing happened. It's, it was the first day of measurement, but we couldn't find any particular thing that could have spoiled this, so we left it in. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's overwhelmed by the, the other data. Um, there's a long list of uh, systematics, and we can talk about all of them if you like. And of course, um, you know the story that the, this is the first indication that the proton is indeed small, so to say, and there must have been some problem with the with the older with the older measurements. Shortly afterwards, uh, a measurement from Paris appeared, um, which again gave the large um, radius in a measurement from the 1s3s transition, and um, and we all scratched our heads. Then uh, Eric Hessels and uh, came uh, with the classical re-measurement of the classical 2s2p lamp shift, and he got a small proton radius. And then um, um, the the electron scattering side also contributed. Um, this is the, the 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 accelerator we have in mind, where the the world majority of the world data on the electron proton scattering for the radius has been measured. Um, the problem here is that you measure a form factor and you have to extrapolate to zero because they, so this is a, the, 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 the cross section or the form factor versus momentum transfer. And you cannot measure at zero momentum transfer, but you rather have to extrapolate. And this extrapolation is tricky. So um, uh, it's best to measure at even lower momentum transfer. And this was done at Jefferson Lab where they've built a very uh, uh, nice experiment. And I don't have the time to explain all of this. The, the main difference is that they don't have these big um, magnetic spectrometers that I showed you before, but they're just looking for you know, very gentle um, um, scattering events where the, the electron just you know, barely touches, is barely interacting with the proton and looking at the deflection angle here. And they have a very nice way of normalizing their data to account uh, calculable um, Möller scattering events. and um, and they also got a small radius. So it looks like um, 
uh, all new measurements except for this one S three S from from Paris seem to agree with the with the small proton radius, which closes the window for new physics in in muonic uh, atoms for the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, what about this one S three S? And um, we've published a paper in in the Garching group um, where I'm still a little bit contributing. Um, this experiment started more than ten years ago, actually in 2006 or so, I was uh, trying to, to see a signal in this one is three years measurement in Garching uh, with a poor PhD student, but uh, we failed. And then um, some years afterwards, somebody had a bright idea and, and then suddenly it started to work. The idea of this new measurement in Garching is um, to use a frequency comb directly to excite the atom. So it's not a CW laser, and then you use the frequency comb as a frequency reference to be able to link it to some GPS or, or cesium clock. But instead, you use the comb directly for a measurement in the two photon uh, regime. That works because if you look at the um, the envelope of the pulse, for example, you see that two uh, photons from the central mode coming from the left and from the right excite the um, the uh, the atom, but also one mode from the left and one mode from the right. Uh, one photon from the left mode and one photon from the right mode, which are then separated by the by the uh, repetition rate of the comb, can also excite the 1s to the 2s transition. And so the whole comb contributes to the excitation signal. Um, but it's uh, much easier to produce this uh, short wavelength radiation at 205 nanometers um, because uh, the conversion efficiency goes with the with the um, is it's a nonlinear process and this pulsed laser. This mode lock laser is pulsed, makes it much easier to produce 205 nanometer. Um, one feature of this, or misfeature of this, is that um, the repetition rate of the comb folds the whole excitation spectrum by the repetition rate. And there you see that um, all, ex all um, spectral features of the hydrogen 1s to 3s manifold are folded on top of each other. And this is the transition we are after. And by changing the repetition rate, you can move these peaks around and make sure that there is a mostly flat background here where this very sharp line is. You see all the S and D um, contributions from, uh, um, from the various uh, possible excitations. OK. Uh, again, it's a cryogenic beam. And uh, the direct frequency comb spectroscopy, there's many more details to that. Um, it's, um, it's a very sophisticated setup and, and the students there worked uh, you know, at more than a decade on, on, on perfecting this. And um, this is the result. It, it is um, the same two sigmas away from the Paris measurement and from the Munich measurement, but that's because the sigmas are different. If you take combined sigmas, this one dominates here and here this one dominates. Uh, we would argue that it's on the small side of the of the of the chart, and therefore it's it's um, more agreeing with the small radius than with the larger one. But of course, this has to be looked into in, in further detail. It could also be that there is still some some theory missing, some theory contribution, um, or there's still some systematic which we've overlooked. Um, but at least um, um, these two. Um, I don't know how you want to deal with that. If you average them, it's more on the left side as well. So I, I guess the the proton radius puzzle is over. Um, we are now we now know a, a better value for the RMS charge radius of the proton. We've revised the Ripper constant, and um, this has probably revived the 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 idea that you can test QED uh, with hydrogen, uh, which has been a bit dormant for the last maybe since the end of the 90s because of the lack of the precise proton radius. And if you look at this, right, in the, initially we had, we had error bars which span the whole screen in hydrogen measurements. Now a single measurement can get an accuracy which is uh, compatible with the co-data, previous world data, least square adjustment. And, um, and uh, now we are, we are getting to very small uncertainties. And if this continues, um, you can actually um, start to look at for, look for discrepancies at the next digit or the next next digit. And maybe there's eventually, if the muon g minus two discrepancy is real, at, at some point this may also show up in in uh, hydrogen versus muonic hydrogen. Okay. Um, on the muonic side, we've continued. We have um, measured uh, muonic helium four and muonic helium three. Um, again, this is hydrogen-like, so we replace both electrons in a helium atom with a single muon. Well, we replace it; just happens, right? So when the muon is stopped, uh, it's ionizing the target gas. 
and it kicks out the electrons and the OG rates are so large that uh, this thing then wants to be uh, you know hydrogen like and um, um, again there's a, an equation and you see that now everything is scaling up right so the the, the lamp shift suddenly starts to be in the in the visible or red near infrared um, um, laser regime this two photon exchange term really explodes it goes up by a lot right and the, also the uncertainty goes up but also the sensitivity coefficient is 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 much larger right so it's really um, uh, muonic atoms are the way to go if you want to determine um, charge rate yeah um, for muonic helium three this is still in the works the paper is, is um, the first draft has been written for a long time but it has somehow stalled we're working on it again now um, we've measured three transitions and these three transitions are, are important because the 2s hyperfine splitting is also uh, depending on some nuclear properties it's uh, the magnetization distribution which determines the hyperfine splitting of course and so we we needed three uh, two transitions at least and, and better three transitions to be able to to disentangle the lamp shift which is depending on the charge radius from the hyperfine splitting and uh, here you see that the, the theory error from the from the polarizability is actually 10 times larger than our experimental uncertainty and there is no no news. It's uh, there's uh, excellent agreement between the electron scattering world average and our muonic helium three uh, measurement. Um, there's unfortunately not yet uh, value from atomic physics for the helium uh, nuclei, but uh, there's excellent progress on this. On the on the on the one hand, there is a good measurement. Uh, there are good measurements of um, of helium three and helium four transitions in atomic helium, so with two electrons. And it seems that Krzysztof Pachutski and co-workers have pushed the theory of QED in these three body systems to a point where you will be soon able to extract charge radii. Actually, the accuracy should be there, but he still sees some inconsistencies. So he, he has refrained from pro, uh, providing uh, a value of the helium-4 charge radius. Once this uh, property theory problem is settled, um, they will be able to determine both a ripper constant and um, uh, helium four charge radius, and at the same time helium three is also investigated, and the isotope shift invest is investigated, and so we will have a, um, a helium three charge radius as well um, from normal atoms. Uh, also, uh, hydrogen-like helium ions are under investigation. Um, that needs fancy lasers and so on, uh, but this is also on a good way. And there you can then use the the established hydrogen theory. So there's news on this uh, coming up in the next, I hope, few years. Um, okay, and then finally helium four. This has been published recently. Um, this is um, this is the data that we measured. One of the two lines. There are only two lines because we have no hyperfine splitting in helium four. Um, this is the data we, which we measured. Um, um, some new physics models said there should be something here, but this is just you know fluctuation. Um, if you convert our measurement into a charge radius, this is the band with the theory uncertainty from the polarizability and the experimental uncertainty on the inside. And this is the world data on el elastic electron helium scattering. And there's excellent agreement and uh, we are a factor of four so better than the scattering data. Um, this theory now concern contains an estimated, uh, uh, um, uh, educated guess about this not yet calculated three photon exchange with the nucleus. Okay, there's another transition which we've me measured. Ah, yeah, and, and there's this one. This was an heroic measurement by a group at, at CERN in the 70s uh, who claimed that they had seen this transition. And uh, funny enough, so we exclude this measurement by many sigmas, our, our point is here. And there you don't have to have any theory, right? It's just if you compare their wavelength with our laser frequency, that is, there is no ambiguity here. The funny thing is that they used their measurement, which was apparently wrong, uh, and the incomplete theory that of that time in the 70s to determine the helium-4 charge radius, which is actually not so very far away from the one that we found. So that's a funny coincidence of wrong experiment and wrong theory or incomplete theory. Okay. Yeah, so um, these muonic helium measurements, um, they're of course a benchmark for, for uh, nuclear physics of these few nucleon theories. Um, we can, uh, they can be used to fix low energy constants of phenomenological potentials. And we slightly improve the charge radii of these interesting halonuclei, um, where you have a helium helium six and helium eight, 
which live astonishingly long, like you know, a, uh, nearly a second and nearly 100 or 100 milliseconds. Um, and um, the, the isotope shift has been measured with respect to helium-4. And the previous measurement was good enough from electron scattering, but now it's limited by the isotope shift. So that could be improved. And these hollow nuclei are very interesting from a nuclear physics point of view. But also for BSM physics, um, there were some suggestions how a new force carrier could fix G minus two and the proton radius discrepancy. It was never very natural. You had to fine tune this. Um, but the predictions um, are now ruled out. Uh, I, I think, except for one, all of them are ruled out um, um, by the helium four measurement. And then, as I said, there are helium and helium plus uh, measurements. Uh, you can improve bound state QED tests um, because this is interesting because these um, this two loop correction scale is Z alpha to the six, seven, or eight. And, and so they scale a lot. They're 30 times larger in helium plus than in hydrogen. And so in order to test QED at the next uh, level, it's in, in, important to have these measurements and have a good charge radius, uh, ch charge radius in order to be able to, to determine this uh, or to do this QED st test. OK, conclusions. <clears throat> Our muonic atoms and ions can provide uh, an order of magnitude more accurate charge radii if you get the polarizability calculated to uh, good enough precision or and that's what we do in in order to determine these um, these uh, charge radii with you know one digit less uncertainty here um, uh, or you can uh, you determine the nuclear polarizability if we get the charge radius from somewhere else for example from electronic atoms and from isotope shifts so uh, we have a, a, a very f a delicate tool to, to um, um, pro uh, pro properties of the proton and a few nuclear nuclei. Um, OK, so what's next? Um, we are working on muonic hydrogen again, um, because the proton does not only have a charge distribution, it also has a magnetization distribution. And um, that governs the hyperfine splitting. You all know this picture. This is the sky in hydrogen. It's the, the 21 centimeter line in hydrogen, um, the ground state hyperfine splitting, which has been measured uh, to 12 digits already 50 years ago. Um, but embarrassingly enough, um, today we can only calculate six of these digits um, because of proton uh, size and polarizability or proton structure effects. And um, uh, you can also determine these quantities. Uh, so this is, this is uh, sorry. Um, this hyperfine splitting depends on the so-called Zemach radius, because Mr. Zemach first observed that it's not the magnetic RMS radius, but it's a convolution of electric charge distribution and magnetization distribution. That is because the, um, oops, the charge distribution changes the wave function of the electron orbiting a hydrogen or a proton. And then this electron probes a different part of the magnetization distribution. That's how this, this uh, convolution comes about. You can also determine it from electron scattering if you multiply electric and magnetic form factor. So again, you have different ways to look at this electronic atoms, muonic atoms, and electron scattering. And, uh, and this is the, the picture, uh, propaganda picture of, of uh, what this looks like. Depending on whose theory of the polarizability you use, you can, from hydrogen, get you know, these values of the Zemach radius. Um, the old electron scattering data seem to favor a large radius, while it's the most recent one seems to favor a small radius. There's uh, improved measurements are, are on the way. Um, and this is our value from 2013 from Munich Hydrogen. That is, if you take two transitions, two lamp shift transitions, and subtract them, then you get this. And the, the subtraction uh, gets a lot of noise into this uncer uh, large uncertainty, right? You could subtract, subtract two numbers of, of similar size. That's why our, the hour bar is large, and our, our goal is such an error bar in the end. And that's by doing done by measuring this uh, uh, hyperfine splitting in the ground state, not in the excited state. Um, and um, yeah, so I think I'll skip that. And another, so that's going to be done at PSI. And uh, in, in Mainz, we are thinking of uh, improving the situation on this nuclear chart here. Uh, in principle, one could measure muonic lithium uh, ions and improve by a factor of 10 these uncertainties on the helium, uh, lithium-6 and lithium-7 isotopes. Um, that only <laughs> requires a very dense lithium vapor target. And we are working on 
at the moment still on lithium and doing uh, fun stuff with the lithium mod and so on. But eventually we will be going into the direction of of producing very dense lithium uh, vapor cells uh, where we can stop muons in. And then we need a laser that spans the visible um, to be able to search for this resonance um, because the uncertainty here means that um, we don't know where to look if it's blue light or red light that we have to use. But it's uh, similar. Um, the, the lines are white. So it's it's like 40, 40 measurements at 40 different wavelengths. Uh, it's really wavelength measurements. It's not frequency. So you measure wavelengths because it's the lithium-6 charge radius is green <laughs> light or so. Um, and then we can also eventually, um, we could use um, a beryllium uh, ions in a, in a trap, in a penning trap. Um, and improve on this by a factor of five or 10, depending on, on the polarizability. In fact, the, the measurements would be a factor of 100 better, but the polarizability calculations have to catch up. And then finally, there's the tritium uh, nucleus, which is the missing link um, between, um, between uh, the, measure, the, the nuclear we've measured in, in, in the hydrogen chain and then the helium chain. This is very interesting to have this three nucleon nucleus and be able to test, you know, proton versus neutron isospin properties of these three nucleon systems. And this is an embarrassingly large uncertainty from electron scattering. Uh, I think today nobody wants to measure uh, with tritium. At least Tetensch doesn't want to measure 1s, 2s in, in tritium in his lab. And that's um, exactly what would be needed uh, to link um, the proton radius to the triton radius by an isotope shift measurement. And that's what we're doing in this T-Rex triton radius experiment in Mainz. Our idea is to produce um, to, to uh, produce cold hydrogen atoms and then eventually trap them and um, do laser spectroscopy of, of, um, of trapped hydrogen and then trap deuterium atoms. And there we know the answer uh, from the measurements in Garching. And then we can study the systematics. And we have to measure only uh, with one kilohertz un uncertainty in order to improve this by a factor of 400, this, um, this charge radius of the triton. So if we if we only get to 100 kilohertz, we start to improve on the on the triton radius, and then every improvement in spectroscopy will improve the, the triton charge radius. So we have a magnetic guide of hydrogen atoms now that uh, is actually working. Uh, we have a lithium mod, and we try to um, to um, use the lithium mod as a cold buffer gas to provide some energy loss to the to the hydrogen atoms in the magnetic quadrupole guide to be able to trap them and then do laser spectroscopy in this in this trap setup. And uh, with that, I'd like, and of course, mention, uh, you know, highlighting all the people uh, who did all this, this uh, wonderful work. Uh, I would like to thank you for your uh, interest and um, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much. That That's an amazing, amazing body of work and <laughs> precision spectroscopy. Um, so, uh, so the floor is definitely open for questions. Uh, Randolph, it's Charles. Uh, <laughs> this is maybe a little bit uh, beyond the scope of your presentation day, but could you say a few words about um, the spectroscopy, let's say of Rydberg states of a muon uh, attached to a proton or a helium nucleus. I mean, there. I know there's a, been quite a bit of work over the years in pionic atoms. I'm just wondering the degree ah, to okay, which, yes. which the ordinary, the ordinary, let's say, uh, Bohr-like spectra of uh, a muon attached to a, a hadron or have been measured with any accuracy. Yeah. Yeah, great you bring this up. Actually, I did my diploma thesis on antiprotonic helium at CERN. <laughs> uh -huh. So um, yeah, so that's what can... I'm thinking about. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. So you, what there's a funny there's a funny system which is called antiprotonic helium or pionic helium, which is if you take um, an antiproton or a, a pion and stop it in matter, usually it annihilates within picoseconds because the strong interaction um, basically uh, you know destroys these quark anti quark pairs with the nucleus immediately. For helium, there's this uh, funny exception that you can populate uh, high-lying Rydberg states for uh, heli for antiprotonic helium. This is around n equals 38. Yes, uh, at, I, I've at, seen that. Yeah, you get yeah. it's amazing. You get a capture. This it's a classical uh, capture criterion. Yeah, the natural yeah, so, so, Rydberg state is the uh, high Rydberg state is the first stop on the train. 
Yeah, so so it's it's circular states, and um, mm -hmm. and um, there's uh, certain mechanisms which stabilize the muon, and they live for microseconds. Okay, instead of picoseconds, they live for microseconds. And you can do laser spectroscopy because for some awkward uh, reason, this is invisible. So you can use visible lasers to do that. Um, and you can determine the antiproton mass um, from that with great precision. And recently, Masaki Hori has done this uh, on the pion as well in, at PSI using pionic helium. Um, this is a three-body system. So the helium nucleus, one electron, and then this uh, exotic um, uh, hadron there, um, or exotic particle. For muons, these guys don't exist. That's very funny. People have looked for long, uh, you know, for delayed X-rays coming uh, from the cascade of muons stopped in helium. Um, and uh, since the muon does not undergo strong interaction and it basically lives forever on the time scale, uh, you would be able to see um, muonic Lyman alpha X-rays um, very much delayed to the muon stop when this thing cascades down from these high-lying uh, rubric uh, states. And they don't exist. And that is because of the mass ratio. There is no, uh, there seem to be no stable or long-lived states in very high rubric uh, uh, states. Um, and um, so they only exist for pions, uh, kaons, uh, and antiprotons, unfortunately. Is there a simple reason for that, to under, a way to understand that? Well, it's the mass, um, the mass um, which matters, and the question of at what initial. So, um, the initial capture um, happens at something like the the square root of the reduced mass. So it's fourteen for for muonic uh, helium, it's sixteen for uh, pionic helium, and it's thirty eight or so for antiprotonic helium. That is with the wave function overlap because the the the, the exotic particle tries to replace, uh, tries to occupy a state which has the maximum wave function overlap with the 1s electron that it replaces. Uh -huh. So it's it's captured too low. And then you have uh, uh, still the second electron around, which can eventually be uh, excited with- uh, I see, so you have, you have to cap, the initial capture has to be to a state that where the mean radius is well inside a, a bore radius for the electron. So the, you have a lack of screening of the uh, yeah no I think the, the screening charge. is always the same but it's just that the, the level spacing is then um, probably too large or so in the um, so the level spacing is not favorable and the, and the stabilization in antiprotonic helium is such that in order to pick up the twenty four electron volts is it twenty four that the you need to kick out the second electron. You have to have at least delta n equals three or four transitions. Yeah. And for the circular states, this also involves lots of delta L. And this is very unprobable. That's why these, these, um, these uh, states are long-lived. But if you come to lower, uh, to lower orbits for the muon, you can probably get, get away with less delta L. And that, that means that the, the second electron is immediately ejected. I think that's the mechanism, or that uh -huh. should be the mechanism. Thank you. Uh, this is Bill Phillips. Um, first, I, I want to thank you for mentioning the, um, the quantum interference. Uh, it seems that this is something that is um, not as well known as it ought to be and keeps getting rediscovered. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, the nuclear know physics guy know this, right? So they, that's why their <laughs> rows and omegas have these funny shapes in their, when they smash things together. Yeah. That's the interference terms. But the so, atomic so, physicists seem to have forgotten about it. And, and, and well, anyway, so it's a great service that, uh, that, that, that you, uh, you mentioned this. And I hope that uh, everyone who hears you talk uh, doesn't forget it if they if they happen to do an experiment where it matters. Um, uh, Trey Porto, I don't know if he's in the uh, yeah he is in the audience. Uh, and Craig Sansonetti and others uh, worked this out for lithium. And you're talking yes. about Eric Hessels many many years ago with Dave Pritchard. We we uh, uh, found this at MIT, and uh, it just keeps getting rediscovered. And and uh, and we need to have it better known. Anyway, my my that's my comment. My question though is um, coming back to the question that Charles asked in the um, uh, in the middle of the talk about the polarizability of the nucleus and of the nucleons. And um, 
uh, Charles was was asking that uh, about um, the polarizability being sort of classical, and uh, I'm guessing that by a classical polarizability you would say, well, let's say that I've got two nucleons and they're bound by a certain force um, function, and then I just ask what happens to uh, uh, to their binding as I apply. An electric field, whereas quantum mechanically, I guess what you would say is, uh, how much of the first excited state do I mix in when I uh, when I apply an electric field? And I should probably know this, but I'm I'm only guessing that those are probably the same to first order. But um, but, but if I talk about a nucleon itself, and I, then then I'm talking about what happens to the quarks, I'm guessing, and. And that doesn't sound like that's going to fit in there at all. So could you just say a few more words and relieve my ignorance about this whole, whole thing? <laughs> you know, I, I'm an atomic physicist. So this is deep in nuclear physics. But I, what I think I understand about this is, yes, um, these two approaches are, I mean, for the nucleus, they are the same in first order. There's a beautiful paper by Jim Fryer written about something called the zero range approximation in determine deuteron parameters. And there you see... Uh, maybe I have a backup slide. No, I don't have. Maybe I have a backup slide on this. Um, and there you see that. No, I have backup slides on everything. Uh, here. Yes. So, um, so this is the the theory summary that we've we've somehow created uh, with the uh, with lots of communication from the original authors. Um, so Jim Fryer used the zero range approximation. That is basically determining, so basically the idea is that you take a wave function um, that matches the long range, long range wave function of the, of the deuteron, and uh, it doesn't matter how the details look inside, okay? And then you can do um, these, these uh, calculations of some matrix elements, and they are astonishingly well in uh, absolutely perfect agreement on the percent level or so um, with um, two nucleon forces based on, you know, this... Um, AV18 potential or some some chiral inspired uh, effective um, nuclear force, and this has been done by several groups. Now, if you look at the at the published numbers, you get the impression that they have large discrepancies, but that comes from the fact that not all terms have been calculated by all authors. But if if you take it like this, you see that the dipole, the, the leading dipole uh, excitation, um, is in perfect agreement, and we use. Um, the, the spread of these various ways to calculate this in order to estimate um, an uncertainty budget for this, right? So different nuclear models give different answers and we just say this is a one sigma error, the, the, the full spread. Now, this is the nuclear, nuclear part and um, you see the uncertainty on this is on the, on the percent level, 0.01 milli electron volts. Um, but then you also have to consider the nuclear nucleons themselves. So the proton itself can talk with one of these or two of these virtual photons. And then you are back at the polarizability of the pro muonic hydrogen um, 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 experiment. And uh, this has to be folded in. And then you have to scale it with the wave function overlap and, and, and whatnot. And, and we do this. And this has the same uncertainty. So this is now equal, equally important, the nuclear and the nucleons. Um, the most important term on the nucleon side comes from the question, um, this subtraction term, which I briefly mentioned on, on the um, polarizability of the proton, this has been not at all been calculated for the neutron. And so we assigned this 100% uncertainty. And that is the, the error bar here. So. Um, you have to take this all into account, and for the for the uh, larger nuclei, um, basically here the, the group of Sonia Bakker in Mainz is has calculated this um, with these different uh, nuclear um, forces, two nucleon, three nuclear forces, and uh, look, looking in um, you know for different power counting in in chiral perturbation theory, they 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 kept uh, estimating the error bars in to which order they go, and uh, that's how we get the uncertainty. But this is all I know about this basically. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, Bill, if I could just comment. Uh, I once asked Evans Hayward uh, a, you know, a very similar question about the ground state polarizability of the deuteron. And she had actually studied that by looking at the photo, dis photo disintegration spectrum of the deuteron as a function of energy and using that you know, with the sum over states to reconstruct the ground state polarizability. And it was even, even at the level of 
very simple atomic physics. It was complicated because there's um, configuration interaction in the ground state of the deuteron, and that that complicates the uh, the photoabsorption spectrum. But certainly, as as Randolph was saying, these zero range methods get a lot right for the the binding energy of the deuteron, and for the um, the photo disintegration spectrum. And this is the this last column. This is Carlson et al. They take the photo disintegration data um, for the deuteron. Ah, oh, I see. And, yeah, and they get um, they get uh, very large uncertainty, so the data is not uh, sufficient there. Um, I think actually the, the, the game would be the other way around. And, and I haven't talked about this, maybe I should. So suppose we now settle the discussion about how large the proton is and people start to accept that muonic hydrogen gives the right answer. Then you can do fantastic things. You can, for example, take the electron scattering data and um, if you fit it with some whatever function you prefer, um, you can fix not only the, the value at Q square equals zero, but also the slope. And for that, you get improved values for the um, for the form factor uh, at larger Q square because your fit is is more I mean bet better determined at Q square equals zero. The same can be done for this um, um, this photo disintegration data, this Compton scattering data, because the um, the polarizability that we can determine. I told you how we can determine this if we know the charge radius and we've measured this. This is a weighted integral over this photo disintegration data. So we could fix this integral and then the data would give much better insights into the q square evolution of this of this of this data so by combining the knowledge from electron scattering atomic physics with electrons and with muons we get the best of all worlds <laughs>